Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Gaurav. I work at VMware on a data center observability system called Network Insight. And in this talk, I'll discuss some of the specific challenges we encountered while building a configuration uh, store layer for this system and our approach to address these. So uh, just a bit of context. The configuration store uh, layer maintains time series for large number of objects. Uh, each time series can be thought of as a sequence of uh, states uh, or nodes where each node maintains the state for that object for a particular uh, associated time span. Uh, the exact details of uh, this uh, layer is not so relevant for this uh, talk. And I'll focus on uh, three of the specific aspects of this layer that should be more generically applicable to many other layers uh, that people are building. Uh, so firstly, this layer integrates with other subsystems by providing a change feed uh, for every modification that is happening within the store. We also want this uh, layer to provide uh, low latency point access and mutations, uh, roughly in the order of 5 to 10 milliseconds, and this is uh, due to the nature of our existing guarantees that we provide out of this layer. And finally, we should be able to read and write uh, very large objects into the store. We have seen records of up to 100 megabytes in size, and uh, in future, uh, this could go up significantly, almost up to a GB or so. So let's take e each of these aspects that I've bolded uh, one, by, uh, one at a time. So first is the uh, change log. So typically, these are used uh, to provide an ordered feed uh, for all the updates happening in the primary store uh, to other subsystems. And these, in turn, react to these changes by taking some specific actions. Uh, for instance, an indexing system could consume the change log for making the updates searchable. Or a caching system could use this feed to keep itself synchronized with the ongoing modifications. The structure of change log keys uh, in FDB roughly follows this pattern that I've shown here. Uh, you have uh, some subspace prefix to isolate these, uh, followed by a version stamp to guarantee uniqueness and strong ordering. Uh, and you have associated value that contains some metadata about the change itself. Uh, but this design uh, suffers both read and write hotspot. Uh, by design, all the logs are appended at the end of this key space, uh, and which will be hammered by all the mutations that are coming in. And uh, if you have like two or three storage servers that are holding that shard, uh, they will get all the mutations. Uh, in addition, the, these storage servers have the extra work of uh, splitting these uh, shards as they grow in size, and then um, ship out the older uh, splits uh, to keep the data volume balanced. Uh, even if you look at uh, from the read point of view, this is the only shard that is getting uh, all the read requests, and that consumes a lot of CPU cycles from it. So yeah, I mean, it is uh, quite saturated design. So this is a graph that we plotted from uh, one of our production systems. And we were able to get this uh, out by using uh, a feature called locality uh, info that FDB provides. Uh, this gives us um, uh, the range boundaries that are hosted on each storage server. So we use this information. And uh, in, in our layer code base, we tag each of the writes uh, and then emit telemetry for it. And that tells us where is that write key going to which server. And in this case, we have a replication factor of two. And we can see that each, each write is going to exactly two storage server. And they are so precisely overlapping that you can see only one color. And uh, though for a large duration of time, uh, those are the only two storage servers that are getting all the mutations. And uh, based on some internal logic, uh, FDB cluster keeps changing these uh, uh, active storage server for that shard every four to five hours uh, or something like that. But it's not so helpful in our case. By that time, uh, the storage servers are already saturated, and they are throttling back uh, transactions. Uh, Okay. So what we want to have is ability to switch the storage servers faster. If we could do that much more quicker, then uh, these writes will keep on jumping from one storage server to another. And storage servers have uh, ability to um, accommodate a small burst of uh, you know, mutations because they have about 1.5 GB of buffer space that they can use. So in order to do this, uh, as in uh, fast switching of uh, storage server, what if we could get our, some kind of a prefix uh, that we could uh, put in front of our uh, change lock keys? 
These prefixes need to have certain properties. They need to be non-contiguous. Otherwise, if they are contiguous, then we will not be solving anything. And they need to be unique. Otherwise, we will not be able to uh, read all these change logs deterministically at the read time. Uh, also, whatever that logic has to be uh, for generating these uh, prefixes, it needs to, uh, it should be repeatable at the read time. Uh, otherwise, we will not be able to find the data that we have written uh, at the right. So if we had such a key, we could uh, use this uh, in place where I've called bucket. And if these, uh, this bucket prefix satisfies all these properties, then we can achieve uh, the desired behavior. So we use a, a simple bucketing function with, uh, without any bookkeeping or overhead. Uh, we take the read version uh, of the transaction. We mask n lower bits out of it. Uh, n depends on how fast you want to switch uh, the bucket prefix. And then we reverse all the bits uh, to give us almost a random distribution, but it is deterministic. And you can repeat it at the read time as well. If you use this function or any, any such similar function and uh, put it in, then uh, what you will get is a good even distribution, uh, fast distribution, uh, fast switching of uh, these logs among storage servers. Uh, but this uh, has an uh, issue related to ordering. Uh, I mentioned earlier that uh, these buckets are based on the read version of the transaction, whereas the changes themselves are based on the commit version of the transaction. Now, if you consider the example that I've given here, TX1 and TX2, TX1 starts before TX2 and ends after TX2. Uh, so uh, like if we consider the change itself, then the commit version of TX1 is higher than TX2, and so it should be after TX2. But if you look at the read version of TX1, uh, it is before uh, TX2's read version, and the bucket derived out of TX1's read version could be before bucket derived out of TX2, and hence the change log could be in the reverse order. And we don't want to do that. We want the same order for the change logs as for the changes themselves. So we put an additional constraint uh, uh, in these transactions, and uh, what we want uh, or what we ask these transactions to do is that uh, you put an invariant that the bucket that you are writing your change log to, uh, it is in some way clean. And you also dirty the older bucket uh, so that uh, there are no out of order uh, change log writes. So if you see uh, what we've done here is uh, that for the first transaction, we have dirtied the bucket zero, which is like one bucket before bucket one, by uh, putting a write conflict there. And we, have, uh, we are expecting our own bucket to be clean uh, by putting a read, co a read conflict on it on bucket one. And similarly, transaction two goes and dirties the one bucket before it, which is uh, putting the write conflict on B1. And it expects its own transaction to a uh, bucket to be clean by putting a read conflict on B2. And this red line that I've seen, this creates a conflict between them. And after TX2 has committed, when TX1 tries to commit itself, there is a conflict due to the red line there. And it gets retried with a later uh, uh, bucket, uh, read version, and therefore the bucket, and things are uh, um, like nice. So if, if we had some way uh, to apply user-defined functions on the version stamps on the server side, we wouldn't need to do all of this. But unfortunately, at the moment, FDB doesn't provide uh, such kind of uh, functionality. Uh, so yeah, I mean, in practice, uh, we can expect to see some conflicts due to this. Uh, but on our on our workloads that we experimented with, uh, it, it hardly matters. It it is like very very few conflicts, uh, almost negligible. All right. So th this is uh, I don't know if it is visible, but uh, this is uh, after uh, this change, uh, what the scenario looked like. If you recall from the earlier graph, there were only two servers active for long durations. And now if you see, they are almost randomly getting assigned. So the first graph is uh, showing you the mutation rates for each of the servers uh, all put together. And the remaining three graphs, I've highlighted one server uh, in each one of them and trying to see how they are switching fast. And it's pretty evenly balanced out, uh, and it changes uh, roughly every few minutes. Uh, the second problem I want to talk about, which is again very generically applicable, is minimizing the latency of the transactions. So typically, uh, these are the four phases of transaction. Uh, you have a GRV to get the read version, reads themselves, writes, and then commit. And typically, this is the range of uh, latency that we see in our systems. So out of these, uh, GRV is something that is optional. It can be removed at some cost. So 
every transaction has a, a, a read version and a write version, depending on whether it is doing at least one read and whether it's doing at least one write. If we could cache these versions and then reuse them, then we can eliminate the GRV call. And I'll go into the detail into the next slide. Uh, but using this, we are able to save about 25% of our transaction latencies at the cost of some of the transactions uh, or, or read-only transactions, uh, giving you slightly stale data, but uh, monotonic. Uh, monotonic in the sense that because we are caching uh, all the read and the commit versions in a process, uh, a transaction never gets to see uh, a data um, older than the last transaction that happened. It will see at least as new the data as the last transaction. Uh, we have to be careful here because GRV is not just the mechanism to hand out the read version. It is also admission control uh, mechanism uh, used by proxy to control incoming transaction. And uh, proxy slows down the response to the GRV if the cluster is under load. And if we aggressively, aggressively bypass uh, the GRV call, uh, then we would defeat that mechanism. So this is uh, roughly the structure of the shim, uh, just simplified version that we use. So we route all the transaction through this run block, you can say as a pseudocode. And the callers get to choose whether they want to uh, reuse, uh, or uh, the callers get to choose whether they want to provide a read version upfront or not. So if they provide the read version, then uh, before running the transaction, we set it on. Otherwise, we refresh the uh, read version in the green block there. And after applying the mutation, after applying the transaction, committing it, we have the commit version available as well. And we pull it out and use it in the cached value. If you see the refresh uh, uh, read version block, in addition to making the GRV call explicitly, we also measure the, um, the latency of the GRV call. And this latency serves as a proxy, uh, as an indicator to know whether proxy wants to throttle uh, the incoming transaction. And uh, like a very simplified approach could be that if the latency is greater than some threshold T, then you consider that the proxy is not willing to uh, accept too many transactions, and you buy and you don't use the cached cash version and go to the proxy directly and let it apply its throttling. Uh, so I mean, T could be like 5, 10, 15 milliseconds or so. If you're under it, then you're good. If you're going over it, then you better go and ask proxy and uh, don't worry about these optimizations here. Uh, note that uh, both these calls, uh, GRV as well as uh, commit version, they happen all the time within the transaction implicitly. Uh, so we're not adding any extra overhead other than calling it explicitly and caching these values. Uh, for write-only transaction, GRV call doesn't happen. And there are some, uh, some more options that we have in our code base uh, to avoid explicit GRV call uh, if uh, it's a write-only transaction. Uh, finally, I want to talk about uh, this third aspect of handling large values. So we get these large values in our system uh, from device configurations that we collect from the data centers. They come in XML, JSON, protobuf, et cetera. Uh, examples of these configurations could be large switches and firewalls uh, that have many ports and rules, and computed network topologies that have uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of paths in, in them and tend to become large. Uh, now, FDB has this uh, transaction limits around both the duration as well as size. Uh, it doesn't allow transactions to span more than five seconds. And even though the documentation says 10 MB is the upper bound for transaction, the recommended size, if you read the forums, is uh, uh, close to one megabyte. But we still want to have consistent writes uh, and atomic visibility. And we want to have consistent read uh, without any stale or partial data. We, we just want to write these large values as if FDB allowed uh, such large values to be written in one transaction, even though uh, due to the limits, we cannot do that. So what we do is we follow a multi-step protocol to achieve it. And it's pretty standard and simple, uh, but useful. So what we do is we start with writing a, like a temporary garbage collection row and give it uh, an ownership of uh, a chunk pointer. Uh, version stamp can again be used as a chunk pointer. It could be anything, a UUID or whatever you want to. Uh, once the, uh, so one thing to note, uh, each of the colors represent uh, an individual transaction, so probably it'll make more sense then. Once we have got the chunk pointer, then we break up our data, which could be megabytes or gigabytes in size, and then uh, write it against this chunk pointer in multiple transactions, maybe in parallel, depending on how we want to write it. Once this is complete, we shift the ownership of chunk pointer back from the GC record to a master record, which is our uh, main uh, uh, lookup uh, mechanism, and delete the GC row in the same transaction. 
Once this is done, the, uh, the ownership is now uh, um, fixed with master, and the visibility is atomic. In between, if there was any failure uh, b before we were able to do this blue transaction, uh, all any partial data would uh, remain uh, under the ownership of GC uh, row, which will be eventually cleaned up uh, by some background task. Uh, when we go to the delete uh, of, uh, of um, these rows, uh, instead of deleting the data in line, uh, we shift you know, the ownership of chunk pointer back from the master to a new GC row and clear the master row all in the same transaction. Again, uh, uh, what we get out of this is if there was any concurrent read happening uh, for that record, it will not fail because the, the data is still present uh, and it will get deleted after some time. That concurrent read, uh, why I say that concurrent read uh, would have otherwise failed is because it's a lot of data to read and that read, uh, the concurrent read might not be reading this entire record in a single transaction. It might be using multiple transactions, so it will not get MVCC uh, benefits. So if I delete the data in line, uh, that transaction would get partial or incomplete data. But with this uh, uh, pattern, uh, we don't run into that. And the background cleanup just periodically scans for all the garbage collect uh, all the garbage rows uh, for let's say anything uh, up to now minus 30 minutes or now minus one hour and for each of the garbage key it uh, clears itself and does a range delete uh, for all the data under the space of it and uh, that's about it like uh, if you uh, consider extensions of these like updation of records they are pretty simple uh, and this protocol can be easily uh, made to do so so just to recap, uh, we have used, uh, uh, we have discussed some of the common patterns that uh, uh, we find running into many times when building layers. Like I've been listening to many talks um, since morning, and uh, I think there have been a lot of mention about change feeds and latency and everything. And I think these are pretty generically applicable problems. We saw um, uh, how we use uh, some of the AFDB constructs uh, to address these issue, uh, issues. Specifically for change log, we made use of uh, version stamps, conflict ranges, and locality info uh, to first uh, find the problem and then uh, devise a pattern for it. For reducing the latency, read and write commit versions were used. And for handling large values, version stamp and uh, multi-row transactions. So using uh, these kind of techniques, we were able to balance out our SS storage server queues uh, pretty uniformly, and we removed uh, throttling happening due to it. Uh, we were able to reduce our transaction latencies by about 25% uh, under certain set of conditions where it was OK uh, to get certain stale reads. Uh, by the way, I think I forgot, skipped the part where uh, for um, um, for the pattern that we have used for uh, reducing the latency, it only affects the read-only transactions. For write transactions, they will never be run into consistency problem. They will always conflict back and uh, be retried. And so they will not be, we, we're not sacrificing any guarantees uh, for transactions that involve write. Uh, in theory, they may run into slightly more conflicts, but again, we don't find that happening too much for our workloads. And finally, uh, we have a pattern where we really do not have any limit on the size of the record we can write in Foundation DB. Uh, so, uh, I mean, we, we don't have to worry what that limit is and uh, whether we are affected by any, any of such limit within Foundation DB. So, I think uh, that's it. Yeah. Thank you.